Dan's Dad. Welcome back to my series on planning for and hiking the 300 mile long King's Trail in northern Sweden. In past videos we've covered general information to kind of hook you so you know you want to hike it. Creating resupply boxes, shipping those resupply boxes to yourself, and buying food along the trail. Today we're going to cover the many water crossings. There's water everywhere. There's so much water that some hikers don't even carry water with them because they can lean down and fill a cup almost anywhere. This is a real typical cup that you find. Some rubberized cups that collapse, they're real common now too. There are four kinds of water crossings on the Kungsleden. There are bridges, you can wade, you can hire a motorboat, and you can row a boat. We'll talk about bridges first because they're pretty typical. After a while, you won't be able to remember how many bridges you crossed even later on the same day. Some bridges are sturdy and have railings. Some are just long metal platforms or wooden platforms for you to walk across. Some are a little past their prime, but you won't have a lot of options. Time to get a little water out of the running stream. It would be a shame to lose Ryan in the water, but he is only from Michigan. This is where I decided to camp last night. It was raining pretty hard. I didn't feel like crossing two bridges in the rain, slippery rocks. And this was the closest flat space. And it wasn't exactly flat either. Going northbound from Hemavan to Abisko, the first significant bridges you cross are Lake Tarnafru. These are visible in satellite pictures and I had sat and stared at them for hours. I'd been looking forward to crossing them for an entire year before I started my hike. Just before I left home for Kungsleden though, I saw that they were being repaired from winter damage and that temporary rowboats had been put in place. When we crossed the bridges, they were definitely still being repaired, but we didn't have to use any rowboats. The view. Sorry for the interruption. Plan to take a lot of pictures from the center of those bridges because when you're going over the bridges, for the most part, you're going to be below tree line. And as you go across the bridge, you'll have a wide open view up the river, uh, sometimes beautiful waterfalls, maybe a beautiful lake with uh, oh, maybe the sun setting in the distance. So prepare to take, uh, be prepared to take some pictures from the bridges. When you're wading across shallow creeks and rivers, you may just rock hop and sometimes maybe step in the shallow parts. Your boots may not get wet. When the water is a little bit deeper than your knees, you need to be real careful, even if the water doesn't seem to be moving very fast. Rocks, especially under the water surface, can be real slippery, even if they appear dry. But if they're under the water surface, I'm going to bet that they don't appear dry, but you know what I mean. The moss growing on some of them will look solidly attached, but feel like ball bearings as soon as you put your weight on them. Take small steps. Keep three points of solid contact of using hiking poles. If you don't use the hiking poles, make sure you maintain at least one solid point of contact at all times. And before you start hiking, Take a look at this video that tells you how to cross raging rivers. My favorite way to cross water is on a motorboat. Six of the seven water crossings that require a boat can be done by motorboat. Some of these have optional rowboats too that you can use and I'm going to cover rowboats next. The Kungsleden blazes take you straight to the dock or the beach where you need to be. Finding the exact place to cross the water is nothing to worry about. When you get off the boat on the other side, you just keep following the blazes. It's a painless transition. You'll 
you'll pay, depending on which way you're going, either before or after the water crossing. Usually they take cash, and we'll talk about that in a second. Where the water preserver they give you. The water you're crossing was a solid part of a glacier just a few hours ago. It's cold. You'll survive less than 15 minutes if you fall in. Often they take only cash at the motorboat crossing. So some of your 2,000 crown cash reserve will be used for motorboats. So now it makes a little bit more sense why I kept rounding up the food budget and the food reserves higher and higher. You can expect the motorboat will cost 300 crowns each. Some are a lot cheaper, but some cost a little bit more. But 300 crowns is a good planning number. The mountain shops we discussed in the previous video stay open to align with the motorboat crossings. So when you get to the other side, you can resupply and then head out as far as you want to go. You can also stay at the cabin or maybe camp someplace near the water. My book has a whole section about the boats. There's a detailed table of boat contact information, costs, and procedures. Sometimes you show up at the dock and raise a small flag that the boat owner can see with binoculars. Sometimes you call or send an SMS. Sometimes you have to call or send that SMS from a sign pounded into the ground next to Kungsleden at the top of a hill a few kilometers before the water because there's no cell service in the valley. At one point, there's a radio telephone for you to use. I had no trouble using my Garmin inReach to send and receive SMS messages with the motorboat people. I recommend that you write all of the boat times and contact information right on the map at the crossing. That way as you're planning your day you can actually see what time you need to get to the water to get that afternoon boat crossing. You can either hurry or take it easy because you're not going to make it. If your plans don't align with the normally scheduled motorboats, they, they might be willing to make a special run just for you at a special price and you can negotiate that price directly with them at the time. We took a couple of the optional motorboat rides too. We had a tight schedule to meet for our first week, so we jumped ahead a few kilometers to ensure our success. The cabin, the cabin host at Sutor suggested that we ride with Torbjorn into Amarnes for a couple hundred crowns. She called Torbjorn and arranged it for us. Torbjorn is middle-aged, maybe 65. He and his family have lived in the area for generations. At shallow parts in the lake, he would slow down and tell us all kinds of local uh, stories and folklore. It's a bit shallow. He got a little teary-eyed as he talked about his parents and about how much he and his siblings missed them. He slowed as we passed a rustic cabin, resting about halfway up one of the many hills. I unfortunately need to contrast our ride with Torbjorn, which is just absolutely wonderful. I totally recommend it with our next motorboat ride, leaving Beverholmen into Adelström. Taking this optional ride put us firmly in the green for our schedule, but I, I regret doing it. I would have rather like, walked the miles. The young kids driving the boat were in a big hurry to drop us off and get back home. There was no inkling of the typical Swedish politeness. They even yelled at us from the dock to eat faster because they were ready to go. We were holding them up. They ran the boat at full throttle, even around the sharp bends. There was no concept of us being paying customers or even being human passengers. I point this out not because this is something you should expect. In fact, you should not expect this. This was so unusual, I keep coming back to, me, coming back to it in my memories. It was so out of place, it should just not, not have happened, and I certainly hope you don't have that experience. One of the water crossings is nine kilometers or almost six miles. You get to decide what you want to do for the day. You can rest by the water, waiting for one of the scheduled motorboats I just talked about, or you can spend your day in a clunky rowboat battling gusty winds and heavy waves. Am I revealing too much of my opinion on this topic? I rowed just once, and that was north of Yakvik, where there is no motorboat option. You must row the one kilometer, or maybe half mile stretch of water. It wasn't bad, but the wind was fairly calm. It was fun. I hadn't been in a rowboat since Boy Scout camp at Two Bear Scout Reservation near Wyalusing, Wisconsin in the summer of 1972 when I earned my rowboat merit badge. Some skills never die, 
but my rowing skills were definitely on life support. Using the rowboats is free, but they do come at a cost. There are a minimum of three rowboats staged at each water crossing. When you've crossed the water in a rowboat and before you continue your hike, there must be at least one rowboat on each side. If you come to the water crossing and there's only one rowboat on your side, you must row you at that boat to the other side, tie on and tow one of those rowboats back to your side and tie it up. Then you can, on the third time, you can now cross the water and keep going. I, nor I hike northbound primarily to have the sun at my back, but since most people hike southbound, they tend to bring the rowboats to the south side of the water crossings. That's something for you to consider as you're planning your hike. Rowing a boat is not without its risks. The boats are heavy and sturdy. It's unlikely that they'll capsize even in rough water or high winds. Since they are heavy though, it does take a lot of power to pull them through the water. Any strong currents or strong winds may deposit you somewhere that you never wanted to be. Uh, STF or the Swedish Tourist Association removed the rowboats from one crossing a couple years ago because too many people were making friends with the reindeer herder really far downstream. And don't hope that a strong wind from one direction will offset a strong water current from the other. Do you really think you'll be that lucky? <laughs> They're going to join forces and work against you. If you have never rowed a rope before, search for video to see how it's done. There are tons of them out there on YouTube. It's, it's not difficult, but basically you sit backwards in the boat. Your back will be towards the pointy or the front part of the boat. You'll pull the oars to your chest. Only one person rows at a time. If you decide to have one person on each pull on each oar, you're going to go in circles. The German hikers that helped me out at the Jackvik Yakvik Crossing were still laughing about the previous couple who tried to share the rowing duties. So, if one person gets tired when rowing, you can carefully swap seats, keep a low center of gravity, but don't try to row at the same time unless you want some German hikers laughing at you too. Row out a little from shore and then turn around, point the bow of the boat the little pointy part at your target. And that's gonna be where you wanna be on the other side of the water. Most likely it'll be a little bit upstream, maybe upwind a little bit, because they're gonna work against you as you go across the water. With experience, you'll get better at aiming, but since you're still watching this, I'm gonna assume you have little or no experience. As you're out there, you've got your boat aimed where you want it to be. Look over the stern or the back of the boat in the middle of it and pick some kind of a landmark. Maybe it's the dock, a tree, a shelter, maybe a big rock. And as you're rowing, that's what you're using to aim. Keep at the back of the boat aimed at that tree, aimed at the dock, maybe the shelter. And every once in a while, look over and maybe you need to adjust, <coughs> adjust your aiming point. You know, roll for two, three minutes and then check it out, two, three minutes, check it out. Just keep making small adjustments and you'll end up on the other side. And now you're thinking, what about that nine kilometer long crossing? Don't worry, they got, they got that thought out. For those, there are buoys in the water every once in a while, and you actually row from one buoy to the next, rather than trying to row all the way across the water, one to the next, and it leads you right to where you need to be. So it's not a big deal. Well, thanks for watching. Next week, we're, we'll begin covering a hodgepodge of topics to start tying things together. These are things that you need to understand, but it sure doesn't warrant, none of them warrant a full video all by themselves. Be sure to leave any comments or questions down below. The Kungsleid and hiking season is quickly approaching, so I'll get back to you right away. Please hike, please hike and subscribe. Share the video with one of your adventurous friends that might want to do this hike with you. And, and don't forget to hit the bell so you don't miss a single video. If you are planning to hike Kungsleid and you need to pick up a copy of my book, YouTube is not the best way to share the detailed information you need for planning your hike. And the book, the tables in it, the checklist, 
That's exactly the best way to do it. So, I'll see you next week. Thank you.